Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. When you start in the wind, anything can happen. Lead us not into temptation, Jesus' prayer says as an appeal to God. This word temptation often gets lost to us. Neil Douglas Klotz, in his book, Prayers of the Cosmos, translates the prayer best of all from the Aramaic. He says, the original language of Jesus, lead us not into temptation, translates, don't let us enter into that which diverts us from the inner purposes of our lives. Don't let us enter into that which diverts us from the inner purposes of our lives. In the Greek, the word temptation translates test. Here we meet temptation, not so much as about our behavior which gets us caught up in evil as, as it is really about us having the strength and the resolve when being tested. Often we hear, lead us not into this time of testing. We have come to a great and uplifting truth. What we call temptation is not meant to make us sin. It is not even designed to make us fall. Temptation is designed to help us conquer and to make us stand. It actually is designed to make us stronger as people of faith. So temptation is not set up to nurture our badness. Rather, it makes us good. It is not meant to weaken, but through the ordeals and challenges of life's times of testing, we emerge stronger, we emerge finer and purer, like that that is tested by fire. We may fail, in the test, but that's all right. We all fail tests at times. Well, maybe I'm projecting. <laughs> but it's not so much the penalty of being human, but the glory, the manifestation of being human. So let's ponder temptation just a little bit. What is the source of our testing? Sometimes it comes from way outside ourselves, right? We choose to take up with those whose behavior and actions really bring us no gain whatsoever. They influence us in ways that lead us into trouble. When we weren't in trouble before, let's call it the Pinocchio effect. We find ourselves tripping down an alley instead of dancing down an avenue. We're moving in the shadows and the light around us dims. Those tempsters snares can take many different forms, but their influence is cut against what we know in our heart is right. Often in a haze, we stumble. Often into the darkest night we fall. Sometimes our testing comes a lot closer than that. It comes from outside ourselves, but from those who love us the most. Of all the temptations, I always think this is the hardest one to fight. Because while the first temptation comes through shadows, this temptation has the appearance of not wanting to harm you at all in the slightest way. You may feel called to a certain place or a certain vocation or a certain career. But to follow that path means abandoning the path that someone who really loves you a lot has declared is your path, right? And so they begin to project to you what should be. To follow that path may be the path you've chosen may be unpopular to your family and friends. Family counsels, they caution, they dissuade you from the path that you feel called to. And they want you to do well, but something different than you're divinely called to do, right? So that's striking and stirring you inside. Maybe they say, do what we want or do it our way, but they do it out of love. In a time like that, you'll find the light inside of you fading and dying somewhat because you've listened to those tempting voices at hand. So temptation can also come from those very close to us. But temptation always, at some level or another, comes from inside ourselves, doesn't it? If nothing inside of us could respond to temptation's appeal, then temptation would be helpless to defeat us. Every one of us has some weak spot, some button to push, which points out our vulnerabilities. 
Each of us has different vulnerable points. What tempts one person leaves the other person beside him or beside her completely unmoved or unaffected. They, they hear what is bugging that person, they can't even figure it out. What, what are you talking about? This Achilles heel or this weak spot is the tempter's delight, right? Whatever the flaw, the fault of passion, the instinct, the quirk, the trigger, the challenge, whatever it is that is moving inside of you, you have to find a way to keep it on guard. For one person, this may be the dream of glory. For another, this may be something that tempts you never to stretch, never to reach, never to go anywhere beyond the space that you are in where you are safe. <coughs> Carl Jung referred to the other side of self as the shadow. In Jungian psychology, the shadow or shadow aspect is a part of the unconscious mind consisting of repressing weaknesses and shortcomings and instincts. He wrote, everyone carries a shadow and the less it is embodied to the individual's conscious life, the denser it is, the darker it is. According to Jung, that shadow is being instinctive and irrational and it's prone to projection. That is, we turn a personal inferiority into a perceived moral deficiency or flaw in someone else. See how my finger's pointing? If this projection goes unrecognized, then the projection maker has created a free hand in creating objects and things beyond themselves that are bad, right? And so that's what the shadow works on. It changes you to say someone else is the problem. When we are tempted into projections on, on others, these projections insulate and cripple us, he goes on, by forming an ever thicker fog, an illusion between our egos and the real world. Simply put, what we struggle with within ourselves, we can project onto others as wrong in them. When in fact, it's our issue. It's our struggle. It's our challenge. The temptation is still inside of, of all of us. It shows itself outside to others. The temptation can come from within, and it doesn't come from outside of ourselves. It really doesn't. It always comes from inside. When we're young, we may feel it strongly, but even as we get older, we do the same thing. So history is filled, by the way, with not the, not the examples that I've been talking about, the shadow side, but history is filled with examples of of people and castles, if you will, that believe that on the strongest side of the castle they don't need a guard because that section of the wall is set for good, right? Or more specifically, there was a ship 110 years ago on April 14th that struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic where it shouldn't have been traveling, and it sunk because they said, nothing can sink the Titanic, oops. What is the strongest part of your projection? What is it that sinks you because you believe you're impenetrable? Watch out for that and be on guard. Temptation is some, something we ask God to lead us out of every time we pray this prayer. It is there for us in every imaginable way, every day. Perhaps we would do well to simply learn a few defenses against it because it has an inevitable presence. First. Let's learn to love and respect ourselves. Let's learn to say no to things that tear us down and yes to things that build us up. It sounds simple, and maybe it is. Time and time again in the scriptures, when Jesus is faced with the tempster, the devil, as you know him, which simply means the one who's set about to trip you up. Now, I love telling this story because when my son Luke was about six, he was really good at setting wires across the entrance from the garage to the back door. As I would drive in the garage late at night from a church meeting, I had to watch for the trip wires. <laughs> so one could say that I thought my son was the devil, but he was just tripping me up. It was just fun, right? Um, fortunately, he doesn't do that anymore because now it would really hurt. <laughs> so, but see, it's, it's a tripster. It's a, it's a tempster. That's the one that trips you up. It's the one that comes to you when you're not expecting it, right? That's what the devil is. So Jesus has a response to this. He says, be gone, get out of here, leave me alone. And we think that's really simplistic, but it actually works. Because every time Jesus says this, he leaves. But 
He leaves sort of like flies at a summer picnic leave the table. He swims, he flies around and comes back, right? He doesn't go for good. And Jesus knows that, but you have to keep going after it. You just have to take control of that. Secondly, trust that the strength that you have and your roots and your tradition, where you come from, really has shaped you. Trust that. Sometimes we forget where we've come from. We forget our roots. We forget the gifts we've had. We forget the things that really nurtured us and shaped us into who we are. And when we lose track of that, we can easily get tripped up. Some of us who don't have particularly spiritual roots, maybe we didn't grow up in a community of faith, or we didn't grow up in a family uh, that, that took the life of God's presence in our lives to heart. And I would encourage you to find those places and find those people and find those readings and find those places that anchor you, if that's your experience. In fact, I offer Jesus as the best one of all to do that. I mean that. In defending against temptation, I also encourage everyone to seek a good therapist or a good spiritual director or both. Some of us call ourselves stoic, and we believe that we can figure out everything by ourselves, left to the devices and desires of our own hearts and minds. We think we can get this. We can work it out all by ourselves. We often think that we can actually work out our own salvation, but we learn pretty quickly in scripture and in life that it doesn't work that way. In reality, the Stoics became extinct for a reason. <laughs> Think about it. Some forget that you need a listening ear and a questioning voice. Seek a healthy person in your life who has dedicated himself or herself to spiritual, mental, and emotional health and well-being and listen to them and work with them. In overcoming temptation, Jesus will say, be gone, but he'll also say, I need you, Lord. And it also tells us in the story that in the desert, it's the angels who come to minister to him. So pay attention to the angels in your life. They're everywhere wanting to be present and loving and caring for you. And finally, remembering all of this, temptation should never be faced alone. I think I sort of mentioned that. Jesus is more than a heroic figure in an old book. We call him our rock and our salvation for a reason. He is. Finally, let me just say a few words before I sit down and we receive the passion story today. Deliver us from evil. In his book, People of the Lie, Scott Peck describes evil as this. That force residing inside or outside of human beings that seeks to kill life or liveliness. Goodness is its opposite. Goodness is that which promotes life and liveliness. Evil is that force which kills life and liveliness. Think about this. At the end of his prayer, Jesus calls out to his Father, deliver us from evil. Here in the Aramaic, evil is best translated unripeness or inappropriate action. Jesus is asking his Abba, his daddy, his father, to deliver the followers with him from that which diverts their attention, that which keeps them from advancing, that which keeps them from doing the right thing at the right time. What is it that you and I do that is not fruitful? What is it that we do that's inappropriate action? What do you do that diverts your attention from goodness, that keeps you from advancing, that keeps you from doing the right thing at the right time? From that presence, the one that creates fruitless lives and inappropriate actions, Jesus knows is out there. Jesus prays that we all get delivered from that. In his little book, The Lord's Prayer, Catholic priest and liberation theologian Leonardo Boff writes that the evil in our times from which we need to be delivered is extreme individualism and a lack of compassion. I would add, it's politics of power that feasts on lies and stomps on truth and facts and follows narcissism as a way of life. In times that nurture this madness, you and I have to be aware of our own sense of personal entitlement and collective selfishness. With such erosion in our connections to others and our need to care for them, Boff goes on to say we shouldn't be surprised when evil comes around. Each generation has to deal with its own evil one, he writes, against which it must particularly protect itself and because of which it must imp 
implore divine protection. This evil being embodies the widespread wickedness that permeates humanity. When two-thirds of the world's population is held prisoner under a legion of demons, he continues, hunger and sickness, disintegration of the family, shortage of housing, schools, and hospitals. The evil one has taken hold and will not let go. But the evil one, he concludes, looks a lot like people we know. Looking out on the faces of his own time, Jesus saw this presence, and that's why he put this in this prayer. He saw the torment that the evil one caused him in the wilderness. He also saw that he assaulted uh, good people and, had, and Jesus knew that they needed deliverance from sickness and death. In this week we call holy, Jesus faces evil beyond belief. As he taught his beloved community to pray, he knew what they were facing. He knows what we're facing. The force from which we need to be delivered, the force which keeps us from doing good and keeps us away from one another is a force which holds humanity, and it must be broken. It must be destroyed. His final petition to God in this prayer reverberates through Palestine in his time and shakes the earth today. Deliver us from evil. Today we enter this week in the Latin, it's called transitus this week. It's called transitus. It means the movement from one place to another. We've already demonstrated that this morning, haven't we? We've moved from the social justice garden and park into the sanctuary. We've moved from palms to passion. We've been making moves already. We will move from a Passover Seder celebrated downstairs on Thursday night to the, to the space here that becomes darkened unto death on Monday, Thursday, to the Passion of Christ on Good Friday, a service that will carry us through the entire walk of the cross, to the silence of the tomb on Holy Saturday and Christ's glorious resurrection on Easter. At the center of this movement, we, movement, we find our Savior battling with demons and humans while being ministered to by angels and humans. He needs deliverance from evil. He needs God to hear and to answer his prayer. Yet in this week, it is the silence of God and the evil or inappropriate action of people around him that will hold this week together in great dis-ease. The silence and the evil are finally broken by the glory of his rising. All of this said, we must acknowledge and face the presence of evil in our times and in every time, for it is truly that which keeps us from doing the right thing. Remember the word Satan simply means the one who trips us up, the one who causes us to stumble and fall. If we do not deal with that which trips us, the power of darkness will grow and we will be dealt with, we will be dealt with on different terms. We don't want to find ourselves lying down, face down, with no ways to rise. Deliver us from evil, he says, and the rest of the prayer awaits us next week.